Well, we're here with uh, Willie Torbert, uh, and we really have a lot of questions that we want to ask about his art and uh, how he developed as an artist. And so, I guess my first question is, when did you first realize that you were going to become an artist? Well, I would say grammar school. Um, it started pretty early. I, I still remember the first day at school six um, in kindergarten, and I still remember my um, teacher, her name was Miss O'Connor, a young white woman. And uh, I was crying because I missed my mama. You know, and I was crying. <laughs> and um, she gave me some uh, clay doh. And I and I started playing and molding it and making all kinds of all kinds of objects and and then she gave me some paper and I was drawing and um, I didn't notice it really that point but I would say second third grade is when I noticed I had something happening and then I know that on oh, one day it was open school night my mother came um, <clears throat> to check my grades you know your parents checking I never had good grades I had good art but I had never good grades you know uh, which didn't count for too much I mean in terms of it wasn't an art class. You know what I'm saying? But what happened, um, I found at those formative years, I liked to draw because it relaxed me. And it came to the point that um, I didn't like school. I didn't like math. I didn't like science. I didn't think it was too technical. And I had to open a book to really get deep in study. But I could just pick up a paintbrush or a pencil or crayon and just do colors and lines. And I was always these drawings of guys with big afros and suits because it was all around a project. So I kind of draw what I saw. A guy with a pick, a guy with an afro. and. You know, I would draw stuff like Cadillac cars, and I would draw projects, and, and that was like grammar school time, you know. And and at that time, it was interesting because, you know, it was a lot of bullies. We grew up in the projects, it's tough. You know, the people from Talbot Projects, it's a really tough community. And those same people attend the school where you go to in that tough community. You know, so um, every now and then someone would bully you actually for your milk money. My mother, you know, we had to have that milk every week, you know, about what, 25 cents a week, man. I wouldn't buy a ticket, but every now and then they got taken. The open school night, my mother came to open school night, and she discovered I was an artist because the teacher took out several of these drawings I did. I didn't realize she started collecting my drawings. And she showed my mother, it blew my mother away. My mother, oh my God, my son's an artist. And she knows that from a very young age that I had this kind of creative ability. And and as I got a little older, it became a fetish almost because I would stay up late. And I still have a habit of staying up late because I draw and paint very late. You know, because it's a quiet time. It's like nocturnal. You know, one son of me, you know. And what happened as a child, my mom was sent us to bed. You know, you had, you had uh, you know, go to bed and curfews you know, growing up like I did. You didn't have that ass in the house at a certain time because it's spanking. You know, so that was real. I grew up with that. They call it corporal punishment. We call it love and discipline back then. All right, and um, we would be sent to bed, but I would actually stay up. I would like put a sheet over my head with a flashlight, and I would draw during the night because I had to do it. And my mother, boy, go to bed, turn that flashlight, take your ass to bed, and put it on that drawing pad. You know, so it, it became something that I had to do after a while because it really relaxed me. And when I was in school feeling frustrated about a math equation or what have you, when a teacher would call upon me, I always knew that I can't do that math equation, but I said to myself, I can draw. I realized that as a very young child, you know. Uh, one of the things that was very common back in those days was uh, the Board of Education not only would have, they would offer music and they would offer art classes in school, but every year they would drag you to hear the Buffalo Field Harmonic, yes. put you on a Klein Hans. bus at Klein Hands Music Hall. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that they would do I'm is once a year they would drag you to the Albright Knox Right. Awesome, sure I did. I went there many times. Okay, and sure so did. I was going to ask you whether or not uh, <clears throat> uh, going to the Albright Knox made an impression on you as a kid, you know, or uh, did it take a little longer for uh, what you saw to kind of click in? Well, I would say for me, um, my um, high school art teacher was Mr. Fredericks, uh, a Caucasian guy, you know, and um, it was my favorite class, man. He taught art, you know, and he was a very creative guy, and um, and he was always tell me that uh, Willie, you're 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 very talented, you know. And um, and he took us to RIT um, in Rochester Institute of Technology because he wanted us to see the art department over there and the photography department over there. And that's when it put the college above my ear. I would say ninth, tenth grade. Like I said, after that, I'm going to college because just going there and seeing the atmosphere of college kids and seeing kids in studios doing sculpture and photography labs, I'm like, wow! Here I am, fresh out of funky ass projects. Okay. I don't see these big shiny building and this expensive setup and equipment. 
I'm like, man, you mean I could be in it, using that equipment, being a part of this experience and learning something? You know, and what happened, I noticed when we, um, when Mr. Frederick, our art teacher, brought us back. Now, we talk about Rochester, 72 miles away from Buffalo, so that's, that's a field trip that this guy took us on, okay? Great teacher, too, Mr. Fredericks, man. Um, when he brought us back, he would always personally just ask me things. He said, Willie, I said, hey, what's up, Mr. Fredericks? I had a lot of respect, but I like the guy a lot. He said, Willie, um, what do you think about RIT? Wow, it's a really nice school, man. It was nice. He said, well, they have a catalog for you for the 100 best art schools in the United States. He gave me the catalog, and I'm, I'm you know, and I'm a kid like, yeah, I just took it home. He said, take it home with you. I said, okay. I had it laying around the bedroom. You know, you kick back and relax and grab the catalog and kind of flip through it. I, I, I saw FIT, I saw Parsons. I saw the School of Visual Arts. Um, I saw the School of Art in Miami, Florida. I was in you know, Schools of Art in California. Then I came to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. Like, wow, this, this is interesting. They had full color catalog, tree line streets, Clinton Hill, Clinton Avenue, Brownstones. And I was like, wow, I'm going to own one of those houses one day, I said to myself, which I did end up owning one eventually down the road. And I was like, wow. Um, so once you look at the school, you I sent with a stamp envelope for a catalog for Pratt Institute. You know, and um, and when I got back the catalog, I took it to my teacher. He said, hey, Willie, Pratt, great school. It's one of the top art schools in the United States, really. I'm like, hey, man, um, I like them tree-lined streets and the, the houses look nice. And that campus, it looks friendly. He said, Willie, you do good there, man. Growing up in Buffalo, but you studied at Pratt Institute. Yes, but sir. you've actually lived all over the world. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. You, uh, and you traveled, I mean, like you very widely traveled. And so, has, how has your work been affected by uh, the things you've seen, you know, around the world? Wow. And not only have I traveled in several countries and been in several places, I've lived in a few of these places. Because I, I, I start saying to myself, oh shit, okay, I went to Aruba, 10 days, it's over. I said, why are you be over in 10 days? Because it would, oh, wow, am I going too fast? Because I was school teaching the Board of Ed for several years, and I retired in 93, and I started my business, Art Gallery, with the Browns and I used to own, it's IKEA Art Gallery here in Bedford Stuyvesant. And that gave me a lot of freedom to travel because it gave me that independent income. I had to go clock into anybody's job. So from there on then, I would say early 80s, my first trip was Jamaica in 1983. And I had a lot of influence in my life too, Caribbean, being married to a Caribbean woman too, being African American and traveling to Jamaica with her in 83 and this is going to reggae sunsplash and seeing Peter Tosh and Sugar Minot and Dennis Brown, all of my best fear singers there. I love reggae music, man, with a passion. And to and go there and eat the ackee and swordfish, the national food, the national dish. Here I'm an African American, but this gives me a whole other thing on culture. I'm like, wow. So I started doing like Caribbean influence pieces from the 80s. I wouldn't know nothing about that if I didn't travel to Jamaica. So after 83, you start seeing palm trees pop up in my shit, and oceans, and boats and shit, you know, because it had a profound influence on me. And not only did I go to Jamaica, I didn't go for two weeks, I went for 35 days, because I went for two weeks, fell in love with the country, and wired money from my bank to stay longer. And I remember going to Jamaica, man, I would just jump on a place called Halfway Tree, where the Jamaican men who uh, paint and draw and do the sculpture and do everything, you know, and I, I immersed myself with those brothers, man. You know, I felt a, a brotherhood there, man. You know, Jamaicans and African American Southern, kind of the same shit, you know, very similarities in the culture, you know what I mean? And um, six years ago, I was in um, Beaufort, South Carolina, hanging out with a famous artist by the name of James Denmark who has an influence on me, who's a good Where's buddy. he living these days? Do you He's know? in Yosemite, South Carolina. And I visited him um, since he's been down there. He got a beautiful house out there. And, and he's on like 300 acres of land. It's like he's in his own town. You know, he has a beautiful studio and an art gallery. I've been knowing Denmark for decades. And um, from the 80s. And, and he watched me grow as collage artist. I don't know whether he ever really liked what I was doing initially. Because I didn't really like it either. I was just trying to discover what the hell it was. Like, what the hell is this shit? Because my original collages were like construction paper. Cheap materials and Elmer's glue. You know, taping and cutting and gluing, okay, and then it became more sophisticated over the years. But I would say that your work and, De and James Denmark's work is like very, it's like cousins, it's like very closely related. No question, no question, absolutely. I would say my work has more of an urban edge, you know, based on, on where I come from, but also the, my work is extremely Caribbean too, 
extremely. Um, living in Puerto Rico, it was the first time I ever painted oceanscapes. I don't do landscapes with oceanscapes. No landscape out there. It's got that project building in water and concrete. You know what I'm saying? So shit. I see greenery in Prospect Park maybe on them when I go out there, but other than that, it's the and I love the buildings, I love the concrete. I got tons of pictures I just take of buildings and, and you know everything, man, because it's all beautiful. You know, the urban jungle. You know, but um, in Puerto Rico, man, I got um, my work toned down, man. I don't even think my work had buildings in it. You know, everything had a, a blue sky and a palm tree, and it was just really, um, and, I, and I did, I switched up because I did a lot of watercolors. I normally don't paint watercolors. I, I'm, I find it very boring. I want to ask you about that, okay, because you've worked in a lot of different media over the years. Yes, uh, sir. Collage, chalk, uh, I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen any of your watercolors. Okay, so that's something that's new to me. But certainly, it's uh, kind of new to me too. Yeah, but certainly all your collages <laughs> and your line, your line drawings, which are which are marvelous. Thank you. And so uh, I guess what I kind of wanted to ask you is uh, how did your work evolve in that direction? Was it something conscious that it's like, well, I'm going to uh, work in oil, or I'm going to, oh, no. you know? Oh no, not at all. The paint and acrylics or paint oil, like hell no. That shit looked too technical for me. I can't blend those colors like that and achieve that light and that density. So I never fucked with it. But I said, I could show a fuck with this damn collage. I could show a fuck with these pencils and I could show a fuck with other things. Sometimes I could do stuff that other people can't. Like my line drawings, no one can touch me. I mean, I, I, my hand and, and, and meticulous as it is, and it's technical. My artist can tell me, hey man, that's some other shit. I said, I know it is. You know what I mean? So that, that I, I work on my own styles, even to stuff like this, how I use a, a pencil, just the movement and, and the energy and, and the rhythm. I'm practically dancing when I do this damn thing. I mean, I got to get rhythms and, and curves. And, I mean, it's not like, it's like, it's a lot of motion and rhythm and, and stuff that I do. But you know, I danced professionally for 10 years at the Sasa School, West African Dance. I belong to a company called the International African American Ballet. We toured all over the United States. I started um, at BAM, they have Dance Africa, which you're probably familiar with now. The first time I ever performed there was in 1981 through maybe 88. I performed in every performance up to that point in time to my retirement. But, you know, it's like an athlete, can't do that forever. Obviously, your brother that, uh, you know, has strong uh, spiritual consciousness and strong Pan-African consciousness. But I also want to commend you for uh, staying in the community, having your studio here in bed on Fulton Street, which is my as, career, this neighborhood. You can't get more bed than, than Fulton yeah. Street, yeah. okay? And, uh, you know, I see that again this year. Some of your art is being featured uh, for the Central Brooklyn Jazz Festival. Yes, and sir. The Central yes, sir. Brooklyn Jazz Consortium, you know, has uh, asked you to do this again. And so, a lot of your work as an artist depicts images that are like very familiar, uh, especially to an African American uh, person who would be viewing your work. And so, I guess my question is, was that something that happened uh, intentionally with you, or, you know, how do you choose, like, you know, what you're going to... A subject matter? Portray? Yes. Well, subject matter for me is like, uh, in terms of what I do now, I, my work kind of evolve more in terms of what I do. Even though I've kind of done similar things and subject matters for years, but it's, it's becomes like more developed, I would say. You know how you develop ideas, you develop your art, you develop your craft. Like a musician, you develop your craft and you get better at it. You know, so I remember I started doing, in the early 90s, I call it a series called Self Made. Just rather straight up hustlers. You know, I didn't say what they did though. I would give them interesting names and very provocative. People said, Willie, all those pimps? I ain't, I ain't calling them a pimp. You did. So I will let people be the judge. You know, the series did very well. I, I took the series to California. It was real big. I, I did three big shows in West Los Angeles with uh, Tilford, um, uh, what, Tilford Art and Associates over there in LA. And they were very successful. Um, John Witherspoon is a big client of mine. And in fact, I met his wife, Angela, first um, at a show I did. And because um, she bought one of my pieces, I had like five brothers just stepping like the Temptations with suits on and afros and just, and I had it coordinated and they were just moving and grooving and piece turned on and said, John's going to love this. So she bought the piece for her husband, the art show in LA. And um, John said he wanted to meet me in person. He said, I want to talk to this fella because he's, you know, John's from Detroit. In a lot of cases, artists 
for, very fortunate artists have been able to find sponsors, and in some cases, uh, people apply for and get government grants, I suppose, and uh, you know other sources of funding. But is that generally also available for African American artists, or is it like something that uh, we haven't really broken through to yet? Well, I can honestly say what. Uh really kicked off my, my career from the 80s is when I met my former publisher, Essence Art, which is like, uh, was partially owned by Essence Magazine. And that gave me real national coverage. And I would say, uh, wow, 1995, even though I met my publisher, Essence Art, it took them about four years before they published me, but they, they try to get a chance to know me first as artist to be crazy. So they want to get a chance to know your persona, are you patient, you know, you're not a loose screw, and are you consistent as an artist too? Okay, he can just paint one painting, can his cat do several? You know, so I guess he wanted to watch my progression as an artist. And then eventually, um, one of my first biggest projects, which is still a big project, 1995, and the first kickoff for the Essence Music Festival in New Orleans, I did the very first image for that. And I did the second image, I did 95 and 96. You know, and um, the first one, I think the second one I did is The Rhythm is Within Him. The first one I kind of forget, I don't know, a few years back, not that long, but I can't. And after I did that, it, um, it, it made me uh, really national. A lot of folks got a chance to know who Willie Torbett was in terms of what I did. And at that time, I was still kind of doing the pastel type of thing, but not, it was like leaving me. I saw every night a few things would be pastel, then the rest of y'all collage or what have you. And then 96, I went full throttle collage because I had more freedom. And prior to that, I had a chance to get the New Orleans experience. I went there and I partied. I went on Bourbon Street. You know, I, I went to uh, uh, Dookie Chase, uh, I had that New Orleans jambalaya, crawfish and all that other good things. You know, so I took all that type of thing in. So when I came back and they asked me to do 96, I was like, let's do it. You know, and it was great. It was very profitable. I, I should, I'm going to talk about the money in the stats. Well, yeah, I got 8%. You know, we moved more than a thousand. Um, Wow, we moved a, a lot of product, man. People were was like around the line waiting for me to sign these images for them. It, it, it did something great for my artist's, uh, you know, charisma, if you will, you know. And from there, it's like this thing went on for like a number of years of doing successful things. And I, I bought my first commission I ever did, um, backtrack a bit, this is before my publishing deal with Essence Art. Um, I used to sell on the streets a lot of in Harlem at, at Adam's, um, Adam's Tomb. Because I, I love jazz, so I, I met a lot of famous jazz musicians standing in the corner selling my art. I had like Boris Silver, um, uh, Arthur Blakely, um, Bradford, and Winter Marcellus. Um, Jesus, a long, tall deck. I met Dexter Gordon. I hugged all these cats, man, tell them how much I loved them. I, I touched them and hugged them. Especially Horace Silver, I almost took the breath out of him, man. Tokyo Blues, man, song from my father, man. I love that shit. I told him, man, that music touches my heart. I started buying your stuff when I was in college, man. You helped me get through college with studies, man. And your music just really soothes my mind. It's well, when we came in today, uh, you were you were playing John Coltrane. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, I guess if we didn't start the interview, he'd probably still be on. Oh, absolutely. But I want to ask you this, absolutely. though. Okay, a lot of uh, African-American artists, uh, including yourself, have used imagery of musicians. Yes. And uh, in a lot of cases, uh, they'll use images of jazz musicians. Now I've seen you use jazz musicians, but also blues musicians oh, yeah. as well. Absolutely. Okay. So I hope this question doesn't sound a little abstract. Do you think that uh, our artists are ever going to embrace hip hop Im imagery in their artwork? Wow. I mean, like the the the, pick, the uh, just a image of someone like with a saxophone or a trumpet. It's a very powerful image, and it, it persists, even though uh, not everybody in the community is listening to, you know, people playing that style of music. I agree. Cause you know, it's funny. Before you came on, uh, before you came over for the jazz, I was listening to some hip hop. The first time I started documenting hip hop was in the early '80s, cause I used to break dance. Because I saw the correlation with West African dance and break dance, and so I, I did both. And I also like house music, so I'm in the garage in Manhattan. I like to jump up and spin and move and groove. And it's a correlation, they're all African, they're all rhythm. So I was doing hip hop dancing, house dancing, and African dance, all simultaneously. So, um, and what happened, I would hang out with African Mambada um, at a spot at 18th Street, 11th Avenue, you know, the Zulu Nation, the president of the Zulu Nation, the founder. You know, the, uh, he's like a hip hop guy. 
And um, I met him because I started doing these t-shirts and I started doing guys doing electric boogie on a, you know, I had a guy spin on his head. These are drawings I did. And I had this famous piece I did, guy doing a kilt. You don't even see his head, all you see is the position of the feet and the, and the arms. Because I, I saw it so many times I was able to replicate it and draw it. So I started documenting and drawing hip hop from the early 80s. And I got current stuff too that I've been doing that, that's crazy shit. A absolutely. I I'm one of the few artists that actually document hip hop. Most, a lot of people don't mess with it, even traditional stuff. They stay safe, I guess. But for me, I don't. I, I did a piece called Look So Survival. It's two brothers, man, like this. With a jacket on pants, sagging pencil piece. They stand like this. It's called Look So Survival because the men, black men in particular, have to wear a certain mask in order to look tough. So I did a piece called Looks of Survival and I printed it with the late great Bob Blackburn on West 17th Street. He was a master printer. You know, I did it, that with him and a number of other prints uh, over the years. You know, it, just an observation of mine, that in a lot, of, uh, a lot of your work, and I'm looking at some of it right now, uh, you're clearly portraying African American people, but they could be Benin. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you know, and so I mean, it's, I, I'm not even going to ask you if you see a correlation because it's clear that you do. Well, no, actually, uh, it's a style. I have a sketch style I started, you know, with my line drawings. I, I do these faces that look like African masks, and and over the years, the faces become refined, like these faces. But the early stuff I did in the '90s, it's like it's like it was like a Benin mask or a mask from an African tribe, and it came refined. I said, we are African people, and we come from that. So that's very conscious in terms of my features are pronounced with the large, broad noses and very thick lips and high cheekbones and very kinky hair. That, that's deliberate. God, we are black and we are beautiful, and I truly believe that. So I emphasize the things that makes us so beautiful and so aesthetic. You know, so uh, that's extremely deliberate. I want black people to be proud of what we are, and other people as well. You know, so it's like, uh, this work is cross -cover. this is art, this is not black art, this is art. This transcends race, this is my culture, of course, like anyone else's culture. You know, this is what I do, I specialize in black people. I love drawing black people, every time I draw black people, I, I think I uplift with us. Be like, hey man, that's us, man. Look at that guy, he had a thick lips, man, like mine, we relate to this. And um, not only from my mentality, but me as an artist, too, that, that portrays in my work.